First, let's make one thing perfectly clear. The planet does not need saving. Earth has gone through mass extinctions before where 90% of all species simply vanished. Life is tenacious and new species evolve. This time will be no different. In just a few million years, new life will populate this blue dot in space. No, the planet does not need saving. We do. More precisely, our civilization does, since a few humans will likely survive the catastrophe. At, At least for a while. Like Ronald Wright, I want the experiment of civilization to succeed. I too like knowing that the sun is a star and the stars are suns. I like sleeping on a mattress and taking hot showers. I appreciate knowing the speed of light, the history of our species, and the physics of the airfoil that propels my sailboat. Civilization as we know it was only able to develop after the dawn of agriculture some 10,000 years ago. And we were only able to invent agriculture because our climate became unusually stable after the last ice age. As Wright reminds us in his short history of progress, we were no more intelligent 10,000 years ago than we were 20 or 30,000 years ago. But before the last ice age, the Earth's climate was so unpredictable that inventing agriculture would have been all but impossible. Do we really want to mess with this delicate balance just to fulfill short-term economic goals? We, we all know, know about, about climate, climate change, change, but what about ocean acidification? 40% of the CO2 we spew into our atmosphere by burning ancient sunlight is absorbed by the oceans. The water-to-air interface on the surface of the sea strives to maintain a delicate balance. As we increase the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, the oceans act like a sponge to constantly try to establish that equilibrium. When CO2 combines with H2O, it creates H2CO3, or carbonic acid, jeopardizing the zoo and phytoplankton, as well as many other life forms up the food chain. Current pH levels are already more acidic than those experienced by the oceans over the last 800,000 years. By the end of the 21st century, the projected decline in seawater pH is expected to be three times larger and occur 100 times faster than at any time since the last great extinction event. Not long after I started riding my bike again, I found myself at a stoplight, standing behind a car with a tailpipe spewing CO2-filled exhaust in my face. I breathed the stuff, smelled it for the first time, really. Because I didn't own a car, my mind had no vested interest to blind me to it. I knew I was doing something right by riding my bike and suddenly it bugged me that the driver in front of me was totally oblivious to the stuff they were shooting out at me. I made up a simple design rule that would change it all. Car exhaust, I decided, must be vented into the interior of the vehicle. Growing veggies simply involves planting seeds and watering them. Seeds, little itty bitty things, filled with life's potential. Seeds, the kind that Monsanto is doing their best to gener genetically modify and patent so I am forced to buy from them instead of just harvesting them as part of my crop like humans have done for thousands of years. On our urban farm, we see the miracle of life germinating from seeds all around us. We feel the warmth of the sun and marvel at the process that turns solar energy into food to propel our muscle-powered bicycles. We look to the sky for rain. Maybe we even collect some rainwater. We realize that rainwater coming off a tar shingled roof has toxins in it. And we wonder what toxins are raining down upon our garden directly from the sky. And we think back to being behind that car and its tailpipe. Whenever we pick a ripe strawberry, from our garden or eat a sun-ripened tomato, it blows our mind. What is that stuff the grocery stores are passing off as tomatoes anyway? Where were they grown? When was it picked? Where does it come from? Who grew it? 
we want to know and in the process we learn that the food from our supermarket is literally dripping in oil. Its carbon footprint is equal to the car in front of me at the traffic light. One day we see a caterpillar nibble on our lettuce or, worm, or a worm eat bits of our apple. We ask ourselves, how did the big farmers prevent that from happening? That's when we learn about the petrochemicals that were developed for warfare and the, how they are sprayed on our food to make it pretty. It takes six to eight calories of energy to produce one food calorie through industrial agriculture. The return on investment with urban farming is the exact opposite. One calorie of energy produces six to eight calories of food. But there is more. Urban food production builds community as we exchange knowledge and surplus produce across the backyard fence. It fosters food security as we develop local resilience in our neighborhood. It makes healthy food affordable and it builds support for local farmers. Anyone who has ever grown a head of broccoli knows that it is pure magic to have one appear on your grocer's shelf for, for two bucks. When I started my computer business in 1987, the internet was still mostly a text-based communication tool between university campuses. ISPs were just starting to offer public access. Those were the days of Lotus 123, WorkPerfect, and if you were on the bleeding edge, Framework 2, 20 meg hard drives, and EGA monitors. Some of us saw the potential and spent endless hours holed up in our bedrooms and basements tweaking hardware and writing code just because we could. It made no economic sense to spend $2,000 on a computer that did little more than a typewriter and an adding machine, but early adopters like you did. You blazed a path for the majority to follow and as they did the technology advanced and prices dropped exponentially. The computer revolution was born. As we face the reality of climate change and ocean acidification, we once again need innovators like you to lead a revolution. But, but this, this time, time the, the stakes, stakes are, are higher. higher. This time we need a distributed energy revolution and we need it to go viral. At the core of this revolution is a very simple concept that we have learned from the Internet. Instead of being mere consumers of information, the Internet has engaged us all into becoming producers as well. For, For energy, energy to become sustainable at anywhere near the speed necessary to reverse climate change, we need a similar paradigm shift. Instead of mere consumers of energy, we also need to become producers. But not all of us early innovators have the free cash to install solar panels on our house and feed the surplus back into the grid. Not, not all of us have, have the time, time to plant veggies on our boulevard. Or do we? What if we decided to set a new goal? What if we decided to produce more energy than we consume in both calories and kilowatts? As I already mentioned, our industrialized diet is dripping in oil, especially, especially our, our traditional meat-based diet. Since, produ since producing more than we consume involves two variables, consuming less fossil fuel will move us closer to our objective. The first and perhaps simplest step to shave between 25 and 30 percent off our carbon footprint is to adopt a plant-based diet. Locally grown is best, but transportation only makes up 11 percent of the total carbon footprint of our food. The fuel and fertilizers needed to produce feed for livestock is far greater, even before we calculate the greenhouse effect of the staggering amounts of methane that feedlots produce. Of course, living on a plant-based diet has other benefits. Studies show that you can pretty well kiss heart disease and diabetes goodbye when you adopt a plant-based diet early in life. Which brings me to our second step. What are you going to do with all that newfound vitality? Why, get on our bicycles, of course. The health benefits are obvious. Cars make us fat, bikes make us fit. And by exercising our sense of balance every day, we avoid one of the major fears harbored by most seniors, the fear of falling. But bikes also save us money. The average North American spends over $9,000 a year supporting their car habit. Do, Do the math. math. If a 20-year-old goes car-free 
and invest that amount at 3%. By the time she's 65, she'll have a cool million dollars in her bank account. But none of us own a car because it makes any economic sense. We all know it's an endless expense that never goes away. But, but we, we do, do it anyway. Going car free is hard. It's the argument most often used against making the shift to a sustainable lifestyle. After all, we should not let climate change inconvenience us, should we? Well, more and more early innovators are proving that it's no inconvenience at all. And they are driving change. In Copenhagen, the digital bike counter on a major commuting route clocks 36,000 cyclists every day. And over 50% of Manhattan residents are already car free. City planners all over the world are tuning into the opportunities demonstrated over two decades ago by the famous San Francisco experiment. After the 1989 earthquake, in a stroke of enlightened planning, that city decided to simply remove a badly damaged freeway. The result was not gridlock, as we have been taught to expect. The result was that people simply sought alternative modes of transportation. Building more roads to cure traffic congestion is like buying a bigger belt to cure obesity. So now you have sold your last car and are carefree, healthy, and proud to have reduced your carbon footprint by 50%. What's next? What are you going to do with all that cash? Surely an innovator like you is not simply content in investing it in GI seats. How about driving change by voting with your wallet? How about investing your savings in solar panels or micro turbines? If you spend five or ten years paying the $9,000 per year on a car, what have you got? A used car. But if, if you, you take, take the third, the third step, step and spend the same amount on microenergy production and net meter the surplus electricity generated by your net zero home back into the system, you have achieved the holy grail of carbon reduction. You have reduced your footprint by 80%. You are the innovator. You are the early adopter. You are leading the way towards a sustainable future. So get out there and do what you do best. Lead by example. The vitality of the plant-based diet will make it easier for you to ride your bicycle. The money you save from going car free will let you buy microenergy systems until your home is net zero and you produce more energy than you consume. And then if your commitment moves you, plant a few veggies and share them with your neighbors.